it's a great pleasure for the World Academy of Art and Science to be back uh, working directly with Pugwash, uh, because I think as some of you know, or many of you may know, our roots can be traced back to the same events and even the same people uh, when that led to the founding of both these organizations. Uh, we date our history back to the letter that Albert Einstein wrote to President Roosevelt in 1939 regarding uh, research on atomic weapons, uh, and then to the Manhattan Project, which was founded or led by Robert Oppenheimer, one of the another of the founders of the World Academy, uh, which we know the consequences that it led to. And then back in 1954, when Bertrand Russell and Einstein met, again, co-founders of these organizations, to express their serious, very serious 11 men, 11 people, they were all men, I believe, at that time, uh, uh, who became the founders of both WAS and Pugwash, uh, expressing their extreme concern about the dangers posed by these weapons to the future of humanity. And I think when we look back on those times, it's hard for us to remember or now that there was a time when science wasn't as important as it is today. At least it wasn't considered generally as important. But we might say that the beginning of the nuclear age marked the point at which it became clear that the future of humanity rested on how we manage this apparently infinite power of science. And that the idea of science as, a, uh, as an observer of reality or as an ivory tower that could be detached from consequences was no longer valid. That led to the uh, conference in Washington in 1956, the interna first international conference on science and human welfare, and then the next year to the founding of Pugwash in 57 and to the founding of the World Academy in 1960, all founded on the concern that the future of humanity, the security of humanity, the peace of humanity, developed, depended very much on not only the exercise of science, but the introduction of another variable here, and that is social responsibility of science. That the values on which our knowledge-based scientific community had to be founded in future because the destiny of humanity rested to such an extent on what we do with the knowledge and the power that we have. Uh, from that time onward, the World Academy has worked not only in the field of concern over nuclear issues, but over population, over food security, over environmental issues, over the birth of the digital age, and many other issues of concern today. Uh, jumping clo more closely to the present, back in 2013, uh, Evo and I uh, initiated a, a project with the United Nations in Geneva, which we called uh, Need for a New Paradigm in Human Security, in Human Development, uh, in collaboration with uh, the UN, uh, where we looked at the global challenges confronting humanity, uh, and this was about eight years ago, and realized that we're entering a new age where we're no longer able to separate out and distinguish these challenges and deal with them piecemeal. They all have certain fundamental things in common. They're all global in nature. None of them can be addressed su successfully by individual nations on their own. And of course, I'm talking about peace-related issues where we see today in the war in Ukraine that the war is impacting on people all over the world. Obviously, we're talking about issues such as climate change, which hold the future destiny of humanity. But it's also true in areas such as economy, where having uh, trying to recover from 2008 financial crisis, we saw how it impacted on jobs and, uh, and uh, incomes and growth rates all over the world. We really do live in a single world today, which requires 
new levels of strategy, new levels of organization, and of course, the development of much more stronger and more effective multilateral institutions than we have had up until now. Our engagement with the UN in Geneva was renewed again in 2009 on a new project called Global Leadership in the 21st Century, where we again revisited these challenges, but looking towards solutions. And one of the solutions we very much emphasized was the need for a new concept of security. In 1989, we lived through a period in which what happened was unimaginable. In a two-year period, what happened was what nobody believed could be done, but it happened. It was not really an insurmountable obstacle to end the Cold War, to dissolve the confrontation between East and West, even to dissolve the Communist Party or the Soviet Union, which was happened by itself on its own initiative. But it was unimaginable. In July of 1989, President Kohl, or Chancellor Kohl and President Gorbachev met in private. I happen to know somebody who was in the room. And they discussed the future of Germany. And in privacy, they agreed that it was inevitable that Germany be reunited. But the idea of it happening in a period of 10 or 20 years was was unimaginable to them. So they both agreed that it would probably take some some time in the 21st century, probably after 50 years or so. In fact, within 12 months, Germany was reunited. So I'm trying to contrast insurmountable from unimaginable. (laughs) And I uh, I think that the climate threat we face now and the Ukraine threat, which is not a local confrontation, no. but is impacting the whole world, as COVID did, are indicative of a new situation where I don't think we can, we're yet open-minded enough to look beyond the present and see what's possible. Anywhere, any more than the, 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 the victors in World War II, who were empires, with the exception of the U.S., which was not uh, where empire builders and empire owners, none of them imagined that after World War II and the founding of the United Nations and the establishment of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, that colonialism would dissolve. (laughs) None of them planned for the dissolution of their empires. But within 15 years, they were all gone. (laughs) And instead of 55 signatures to the UN Charter, we had 120 members in this uh, on there in about 25 years because the unimaginable took place. When we look back on it, it looks like obvious, inevitable, logical. In that sense, I think of our minds tend to be more like rearview mirrors. We're very good at making sense of things when we look back in history and think it was a logical uh, chain of events all the way, all the way up to the end of the Cold War. Uh, But when we try to look forward, we reach the lack of imagination of our own minds. I had a, a just very briefly in 1989, we founded an international commission and its goal, I'm embarrassed to even say it now, because we, were, we didn't want to be sound too idealistic. Our goal was a reduction of 5% in global military spending. That was in 89, uh, September, we started. In one month, the Berlin Wall fell. And in the next two years, global military spending fell by 33%, not 5%. <laughs> So it showed, I learned from that, I have a lack of imagination. (laughs) Uh, So I think the question is, uh, there is a a, a compelling force now for us. We all are aware of the fact that by keeping the the systems the way they are, we all lose. 
and the threats to humanity multiply. Problems we face today are not that we're much worse in many respects than we are before, but we're not, we're not changing fast enough to keep up with the evolution of society and the evolution of technology. We need to change much faster than before. We need to grow much. We've had history of wars going back millennium. Uh, we have a lower percentage of people dying today on a big population than before. We're saving lives. The reason we have so many people is because so many lives have been saved. Uh, we have greater rights today. We have not only the 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 um, Universal Declaration of Human Rights, but now we have the 17 SDGs, which are really an embodiment of those rights. Never before has humanity come forward committing itself to achieve something on behalf of humanity. So I think to, I'm not trying to gloss over our problems. They're severe, threatening, and frightening. But I think our problem is not so much that we're getting worse. We're not going up we're not going forward fast enough. We're not adapting and changing fast enough to the developments that have taken place. Our educational system is very slow to adapt. It's very conservative. Our po political systems are very slow. And to give you just one example of that, I think we're really, for the first time, humanity is coming together as a single entity. We have never thought, worked, collaborated, discussed, as a single unit before in history and, and, and grappled with problems that are really global in dimension. But our institutions of global governance, what we refer to the multilateral system, is, all, is still stuck far in the past. It was founded by nation states, by member states who still are the owners, the founders and owners of this institution who are refusing to let go of the power the, sov the, quote, sovereignty that has resided in nation states up until now. We need to give power to our multilateral institutions to really act on behalf of all humanity. And there's been a great reluctance to do that. Uh, we, can pet we can point to many pro sources of those problems. The business community, Mampella referred to, thrives on the fact that they're that we have a wild west of, of global economy where there's a lot of freedom for business to act without the restrictions that would be there if we really had an effective system of global governance. And that goes in other sectors uh, as well. So I think I, I tend to think of it as a problem of we're not moving fast enough in our evolution and taking seriously enough the fact that the old institutions are not sufficient. We have to evolve new institutions or changed institutions. We're going to have to shift the power equation and give much more authority to global institutions, which represent humanity as a whole, not just nation states, not just political leaders, not just elected governments or appointed or controlling governments, but really speak on behalf of humanity as a whole. This is an evolutionary challenge. Uh, and uh, I think our, I'm mentioning it now because I think our solutions have to be of that dimension. Uh, they have to be evolutionary quantum changes in our institutional base. Otherwise, these problems are just going to be coming back again around to us uh, at the next level again. I hope that that will help us look beyond our uh, imaginations to what's really needed logically. I, I don't say it will be easy. In the past, these things have only happened after confronting severe challenges and crises that we have learned to think beyond the present. I hope that we can get to the point with meetings like this and serious discussions like this, uh, that we can get to moving on and doing things without waiting for the crisis to compel us.